Hello and welcome to another NGen Math 8 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we're going to be doing Unit 6, Lesson 1, Introduction to Functions. This entire unit is about the concept of a function, and it's one of the most important ideas in upper level math. And quite frankly, when you hit 8th grade math, Math 8, you really are starting to brush the surface of many of these higher level mathematical ideas. Functions are going to become the basis of Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Pre-Calculus, and Calculus. They're sort of woven throughout all of those courses. So, let's begin by just talking about what a function is. All right, here we go. Functions are one of the most important concepts in all of math. It's really important to understand their definition. So the function definition. A function is a rule whatever that means, a function is a rule that assigns to each input to the function exactly one output. All right. Now, these rules, these rules are going to take many different forms, but the idea is very simple. An input goes in and a single output comes out. In other words, it's like, you know, I put the quarter into the gumball machine, one gumball comes out. Not two, not three, not four, not that, right? If I throw something into a function, only a single value comes out for whatever value went in. All right? So let's take a look at this idea of a function in exercise number one. Students are tracking the height of a kite in the sky as a function of the time it has been in the air. The data they recorded is shown below. Letter A lists the input and the output to this function. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit. First, take a look at actually the language itself. The height as a function of the time, all right? When you see a phrase like that, blank as a function of blank, it means that the height is the output and the input, in this case, is time, all right? So in letter A, when they ask us to list the input and the output to the function, the input is the time in seconds, and the output is the height in feet. Now remember, the definition of a function is a little bit weird because it says it's a rule that assigns for every input exactly one output. All right. Now, by assigning, like what, what we literally mean is the rule, right, is this rule. The rule is this table. All right. This table is telling us how to assign outputs for a given input. So let's take a look at that in letter B. List the outputs for each of the following inputs. Now again, the input to the function is how long the ball has been in the air, the time it's been in the air, and the output is the height in feet. So if the input is 30, literally what that means is, well, at 30 seconds, where is the ball? Ah, the ball is 22 feet above the ground. So the output is 22 feet, right? What's the output when the input is 60? Well, that's easy enough, right? I go along here in the table, right? My input of 60 gives me an output of 34. Right? Very, very easy, especially when you have a table as your, as your rule that's assigning outputs for given inputs. All right? Now, let's take a look at letter C. Why does this table fit the definition of a function above? In other words, we looked at the definition of what a function was, right? A function is a rule that assigns to each input, those are the times, exactly one output, those are the heights, right? So why does this table satisfy the definition of a function? Well, it's pretty simple, right? For each time, and I'm going to put in input in parentheses, there is only one output height. Actually, let me keep it consistent. Well, that, that, that didn't work very well. <laughs> Let's try that again. Nope. Ah, oh, nuts big eraser. For every time input, there is only one height output. All right. 
Right, and it, it'd be a little weird, right, if somehow the ball could be at two different heights at the same time, right? I mean, quite frankly, that's physically impossible. <laughs> All right. Um, so it really makes sense that this is a situation where the height is a function of time. For any given time, there's exactly one height that the ball is at. But let's take a look at letter D. This is very important. In a function, every input must have exactly one output. But can two different inputs have the same output? Well, take a look at the table and see if that can happen, at least in this case. Pause the video for a moment. Now again, I want you to remember, the idea of a function is, if I go to an input like 30, there's absolutely only one output that corresponds to that input. But when we scan this table of outputs, right, what we see is we see, hey, at 30 seconds, 50 seconds, and 80 seconds, right, the height is 22 feet. And that is completely okay. All right. Yes. Let's see if I can spell the word yes. Yes. At, let's see, 30, 50, and 80. At t equals 30, 50, and 80. The height is the same. Or I'm going to say the output. Right, and that makes sense. Right, by the way, that means that the time is not a function of the height. So if I give you a height, there could be more than one time that the kite is at that height. All right, but if I give you a time, the kite can only have one height that it's at. Make sense? I hope. Let's continue to work with more types of function rules. Here we go. Function rules come in many, many different forms. All right. The most common are tables, which we just saw, equations, which we're going to work with next, graphs, which we're going to get to, and coordinate pairs. We're going to get to those as well. Let's take a look at exercise number two, where we deal with a function that's given in an equation form. Exercise number two. In the function below, the variable y is a function of the variable x. y equals x squared plus 10. Give the outputs for each of the following inputs. Show how you found your answers. Now again, I want to be very clear, right? This phrase, y is a function of x, right? Whatever is the function is the output. So y is the output, right? And of the variable x, the x is the input. Now honestly, with equations, almost always it's solved for the output. So if I have y equals x squared plus 10, then it makes a lot of sense that what's going to go into the equation is the value of x. We're going to use that formula then to calculate the value of y. That's going to come out, and that's going to end up being the output. Now, it's pretty simple. This is no different than when we were plugging values of x into anything else and getting a value of y, right? All we need to do, let's say for an input of x equals 3, we're just going to take the 3, place it into the equation, and evaluate the output. Yeah, 3 squared is 3 times 3. That's 9. And then, of course, 9 plus 10 is 19, right? So when the input is 3, the output is 19. Now, I can't promise you this, but in most conventional situations, when we have a function that involves the variables x and y, almost always the input is x and the output is y. Don't get me wrong, that could change in certain situations, but mostly if the two variables are x and y, x is the input, y is the output. What I'd like you to do now is pause the video and figure out what the outputs are when the inputs are x equals negative 5, and x equals 0. All right, let's do it. Maybe this is the trickiest one that we've got here, but it's not too bad, right? If I put negative 5 into this equation, right, keep in mind that negative 5 times negative 5 
would be positive 25. Whenever we square a number, it turns out to be positive. And therefore, my output, when my input is negative 5, is 35. Right? A nice rule. Tells us exactly what to do with the input, right? Take the input, multiply it by itself, and then add 10. That's how we get the output. That's our rule, right? Square the input, add 10. That's our rule to give us the output. And of course, when x is 0, very easy here. We're going to have 0 squared plus 10. 0 times 0 is 0. And 0 plus 10 is obviously just 10. All right. That's it, right? Equations are fantastic ways to represent function rules because you can literally say, hey, the output equals blank. And then you, you literally give some kind of an arithmetic expression, an algebraic expression, that tells us what to do with the input in order to get the output. Simple enough. All right, so equations. We've seen uh, tables, right? We've seen equations. Now, when functions are represented by graphs, which is going to be the next thing that we look at, or sets of ordered pairs, either way, the x-coordinate is the input and the y-coordinate is the output. And, and again, that's, that's exactly the way it was in the last problem when we had an equation. But with a graph, it's pretty much universal. So let's take a look at how we can use a graph to think about inputs and outputs of a function. Let's take a look at exercise 3. In the graph below, y is a function of x. Answer the following questions. Letter A. For each of the following values of x, give the coordinate point that lies on the graph. All right, fantastic. So let's do this together for one of them and then have you do the other three on your own because I know you know how to read a coordinate grid. All right. So let's say we take this one, x equals 5. I'm going to go over to the graph where x is equal to 5. And I'm going to find the point on the graph. And that specifically corresponds to the point 5 comma 3. All right? Simple enough. What I'd like you to do really quickly is pause, pause the video, and go through for x equals 7, x equals negative 4, and x equals 0. You don't need to necessarily like put a dot there and circle it, although you can. Um, but, you know, just figure out what coordinate point corresponds to these x values on the graph. Go ahead and pause the video now. All right, let's take a look. So x equals 7, simple enough. Um, we've got 7 right here. Ah, it lies right on the x-axis, so that's the point 7, 0. For x equals negative 4, whoops, that's right here, right? That's actually the end point, the left end point of the function. So that's negative 4, negative 2. And finally, x equals 0. That's actually the y-intercept of the function right there. And that's going to be 0, comma, 6. So hopefully, hopefully you got all of those points. All right. Now, what do we do exactly? Well, let's take a look at letter B. Based on A, give the outputs for each of the following inputs. All right. So th this was just a precursor. We're not going to be doing this a lot. The point is, if I said, what is the output when x is equal to 5, I would want you to go to the graph, go over to x equals 5, go up here and go, oh, that's the point 5 comma 3. The input is 5, the output is y equals 3. So the rest of these are quite easy, right? Pause the video now and put the outputs into each one of these blanks for these particular inputs. All right, well, when x is equal to 7, the output is 0, y equals 0. All right, when x is equal to negative 4, the output is y equals negative 2. When x is equal to 0, the output is y equals 6. So really, when we use a graph to evaluate the outputs of a function, given a function's input, it's really nice. Because all we do is we take the input, which is the x value, Right? We go along on the graph, find that x value, go up, figure out what the y value is for that x value, and that's the output. As simple as that. All right, Let's keep going and take a look at one last problem where we represent a function using a set of ordered pairs. So ordered pairs, i.e. x, y coordinate pairs, are a very convenient way of showing the inputs, the x values, along with their outputs, the y values that go with them. Let's take a look at that in exercise number four. 
The set of ordered pairs shown below defines y as a function of x. Answer the following questions. Letter A, what is the output's value when the input's value is 6? All right, well, I'd like you to pause the video for a moment and tell me what the output value is when the input value is 6. Now, this is important. You know, we know that the input value is 6, so we kind of quickly scan this, this collection or set. A set is just a collection of stuff. This set of ordered pairs, right? And I see a 6 sitting right there, and I see a 6 sitting right there. So is my answer negative 2, or is my answer 4? Well, remember, the input is 6, and the input is the x-coordinate. So that's the one that has an input of 6, and its output is y equals 4. All right, literally, this isn't the answer. This just tells me y equals 4 is the output. You see, this one, right, this one, negative 2 comma 6 would tell us, oh, when the output is 6, the input is negative 2. But we're saying, hey, look, if the input value is 6, then the output value is 4. All right, letter B. Are there any inputs that have the same output? Justify. Well, what do you guys think? Take a look at this function. Are there any inputs that give us the same output? Which again, let me be very clear. Having repeated outputs, completely okay for a function. Pause the video now and see if there are any inputs that have the same output. You bet there are, right? Our outputs are 6, 5, negative 4, 5, and 4. So it should be pretty obvious that an input of 0 and an input of 3 both have outputs of 5. So that's what I'm going to say. Right? Yes, x equals 0 and x equals 3 both have outputs of y equals 5. Yeah. And again, we really want to harp on this idea because a function's a little bit weird. It always, it always has two variables involved, two quantities involved. One of them being the input quantity, one of them being the output quantity. For any given input, there is only one output, okay? But you could certainly have the same output for multiple values of the input. A great example is if I tossed a ball up into the air and it went up and then it came back down, right? And I was recording the height versus the time that the ball has been in the air, well, every time would have only one height associated with it. But yet, for every height that you hit on the way up, you're also going to hit on the way down. And so, one would think, except for, of course, the peak height, one would think that every output would get repeated at least once. Again, except for that one right at the top. Anyway, let's wrap this up. Today, we introduced you to one of the most important ideas in all of math, the idea of a function. A function being a rule that, for any given input, assigns exactly one output. We saw how functions could be represented in tables, equations, graphs, and coordinate pairs. And those are the four main, way the, main ways we are going to represent functions. In the rest of the lessons within this unit, we'll see specific types of functions, characteristics of functions, and many, many other things involving this very important topic. For now, I just want to thank you for joining me for another NGen Math 8 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.